Got weirdly silent. Well, good morning, New Life Community Church. Norwich, we're so glad you're here. Happy Palm Sunday. Let's stand in worship.
Fear cannot survive when we pray The God of breakthroughs on our side forever Come on, is that true for you? Have you seen it in your life? Sing it. We'll see you break down every wall and watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. Come on. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him I With all creation cry, God, we praise. Come on, just clap your hands. Lift him up. Praise him like we just sang. Yay! Well, we're so glad you came this morning, whether joining us online or joining us in person. Um, happy Palm Sunday. Um, this is where it kicks off. This is the crux of everything that we believe, that Jesus had to come. God had to come on our behalf. Jesus had to be in our place in order for us to achieve salvation, something that we could never achieve on our own by good deeds, nothing. We could never bring enough to the table to be good with God, to be in right relationship with God. And so our subject, our, our, I guess our outcome, our wages to the things that we've done was death and is death by ourself. Um, but as it says in Romans, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus comes in today into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey to fulfill a prophecy and people would cheer him on, and yet, close to a week later, these people would want him dead. And that's us. Um, it was our sin that put him there. It was our sin that he paid for. Um, so there's a, there's a weird balance of mourning and remembering what our sin has caused, but understanding the, the love that's been shown to us. Does that make sense? Makes sense? There's, there's gravitas to this. It's not just some fairy tale thing that you know we hope we believe in that maybe may or may not be real no it's it's definitely real and it's definitely the truth and it's something that we believe in and base our whole lives in and at the end of the day we could praise God because he says he'll never leave us or forsake us so many promises that we have because we're hidden in Christ but I want to read this verse first just as we continue this is the book of Zechariah Starting in verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And I will take away the, char the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the, battle and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations, his rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. I will bend Judah as I bend my bow and will fit Ephraim. I will rouse your son Zion against your son Greece and will make you like a warrior's sword. Funny thing about that passage is that was written as a prophetic message of Jesus to come. And that's what he would come to do. Everybody thought that he would come to fight a person um, <laughs> other than ourselves. But the fact is, is that we needed Jesus to come to fight ourselves. <laughs> and the enemy was us. Um, but how did he do it? He submitted himself out of love for those who he's chosen to save, which is us. And that's why we're here. That's what fuels our worship. That sort of love changes people. It's changed me and it's changed you. That's why we sing these songs. Understand? That's why we sing as one voice. That's why we celebrate the way that we do and we clap our hands. It's not so we could just do it on a Sunday. It's because we know what Jesus has done for us. And we know the bill that had to be paid and that he did it gladly for us. Jesus in our place. So let's pray, get our minds focused and continue. God, I'm asking that you would help us to be reminded of the gospel. 
I pray wherever we're at, wherever we are um, actively following you, whether we feel that we're um, maybe struggling or whether we feel like we don't even know you. I pray that just like in Chicago, when people get lost, they said, look at the river or where's, where's the lake at? And then you could find your way home. I pray that for us, that that would be the cross. I pray that that would be always our point. That would always be our, our foundational truth that dictates where we go. So God, I'm praying for surrender. I'm praying that we would be filled and melted by the, I guess, the heat of that love that you've shown us on the cross. So God, I pray that these songs wouldn't be songs. I pray that they would be reflections of our heart. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
I know of this next verse. We're declaring the resurrection of Jesus. There's power in that. There's victory that we can boast in that. So man, I want you to sing this out with me. It's one voice. Come on. It's he, the stone is rolled away. Behold the empty tomb. Come on, sir.
Jesus died my soul to save. Jesus paid it all to him I am. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. In sin had left a crimson stain. just to remember how he saved you. Lord, why did you choose to save us, but you did? I don't have anything to give you a song or good actions or even a thank you that would ever cut the mustard. you, Jesus. Come on, sing, Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sing it again. Jesus paid it all, and all to Him I own. My sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. love it endures forever. Amen. Please uh, bow your heads and pray with me. Oh Lord, as we enter this, uh, this week, Father God, it's, uh, there's just so much to be thankful for. So much that is represented in the events of this week, Father God, that, that uh, just emanate the love that you have for us, Father. We're just reminded, Father God, of the deep and dark places that you traveled just to save us, Father God. 
the pain that you would endure, the penalty that was not yours, that you willingly would lay down your life for us. But Lord God, we, uh, we're, just, we're just amazed by what we see in Scripture. We're amazed as we look back through the Psalms, as we look back through uh, from the very beginning of time, Father God, how the entire Scripture, the entire Bible, it leads up to this week. It leads up to these moments, Lord God, when you would come and take the penalty, the penalty that we so deserved, and you would, you would die. You would, you would just take it, Father God. You would take our sin from us, literally. And so we're thankful for that, God. Uh, and we, th- Today, God, we just want to honor you and we praise you, Lord God. And thank you for the salvation that we have in you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. And good afternoon. And what's that? Okay. <laughs> Welcome to uh, New Life Community Church Norwich. Uh, my name is George. This is my daughter Liliana, and together we want to thank you for coming and worshiping with us. We welcome you here, and we want to say happy Palm Sunday. So, um, amen. <laughs> to those that are here in the room, we want to welcome you home. To those that are joining us uh, from home, we uh, miss you, we love you, and uh, we just can't wait to be all together once again. So, to everyone here, please take a moment, turn to the sides, turn behind you. Give a friendly wave, happy Palm Sunday, and then you can take your seats. Thank you. Again, thank you so much to the, our worship team. They, they do such an incredible job preparing and, and, uh, and leading us in worship. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, uh, a special welcome to you all. We, uh, we thank you so much that you've decided to come and join us on, on, on this uh, momentous occasion. Um, and uh, if you are new here, we would like you to please go online, go to newlifenorridge.org, uh, or if you can find our app, you can go on there. And we have a, um, uh, a connect button that you can click on and fill out some information. It's just some contact information. Uh, that way we have a way of getting in contact with you and sharing with you all the things that are going on at, uh, here at New Life. And for filling that out, we would like to give you a free gift. So if you're new here, please go online and fill that out. As always, if you have been joining us for some time, if you're a member here and maybe you've moved or maybe you've changed your phone number, you can always use that form to update your information. Um, Getting into some announcements, uh, we will not be holding communion today. We typically do that on our last Sunday, but uh, instead we have the baptismal up front here, as you all can see. So we're going to be celebrating that just uh, in just a little while. Amen. Uh, I, I get so excited every time I see this up here because it's just it's just an amazing uh, I, I remember that, and many of you guys can probably attest to that. You remember that feeling you had when you were baptized. And I, I just get so excited for those that are coming up here and just boldly uh, proclaiming their faith. Uh, so we'll have that later on. Also, at the end of service today, we're going to have a church drive up. Um, obviously, you don't have to get in your cars, those that are here. You could just go outside. But, uh, but anyone who is joining us from home, um, please, at the end of service, uh, immediately following, uh, please come down and you could drive by. We want to give each family a free gift. Um, uh, and also for, for the kids, if you have uh, kids that are fifth grade and under, we want to give you guys a, a, uh, an, Easter, um, an Easter egg uh, hunt kit. That way you guys can do that at home at your own times. So normally we would do that this time of year, right? Um, if you guys probably remember in years past that we would have this monster Easter egg hunt out in one of the parks. And I mean, I can't remember how many. It was like insane amount of eggs. But we invite the neighborhood out, and it's just a, it's a great way to connect with the neighborhoods and stuff. Um, but we want to give you guys uh, this opportunity uh, in the week ahead. So, so please stop on down uh, for that. And uh, also, for those that came in today, you probably saw there was a little desk off to the side. Um, we've got some merch. Merch, yeah, I actually said that. I, uh, I'm not up on, on all the, the kids' uh, lingo these days, but... but It said merch in the notes, so I was like, I got to say it's merch. So anyway, um, these are just a couple of the items that we have. Obviously, as you guys know, we, um, what, Mom? (laughs) So uh, these are just a couple of the items that we have, but uh, definitely, please take a stop by. We've obviously updated some things, uh, some logos and stuff recently, but I think this is really the first time that we've had, you know, this stuff type of stuff available. So please go out and represent New Life. Um, But you can go to the desk there and you can purchase those items. Um, And then finally, you guys, uh, this coming Friday is Good Friday. So we're going to have a special service that evening, 730 to 830. And then 
Easter Sunday will be the normal time next week. So just keep those things in mind. Uh, and now let, let us just continue in worship um, with our giving. As you know, we won't be passing out the, uh, the baskets um, because of COVID. So um, if you are going to be giving an offering, you can fill out one of the envelopes in uh, the pews. And then you could drop that off. We've got the, the little box outside, or you could put it in the basket with one of the, um, one of the ushers at the end of service. Um, obviously, the other great way that, uh, and the way that I prefer to give is online. Uh, and if you actually text the word, it's all one word, NL Norridge, it's N L N O R R I D G E, to 77977. That's going to give you a link, and that'll, that'll, um, bring you right to our giving page, and you can go ahead and give on there. Um, you can do it one time. You can do it. Um, you can set it up as a recurring thing, um, but that's just an easy way to do it. I know nowadays everything's electronic. It makes our lives so much easier. Now, if you say, I want to write a check, that's, how, that's what I do, good for you. Um, you can still do that. Just make it payable to New Life Community Church and write Norwich in the memo, and then you can mail that to our main office, and we'll put the, um, the address for that in the uh, comments for, uh, for the video. So. Uh, please just take a moment and bow your heads with me as we uh, pray over this offering and continue in our service. So, uh, Lord God, we just have so much to be thankful for, Lord, um, the way that you've provided for us, particularly in, uh, in this last year, Lord God. Uh, you, you've, you've literally moved, um, you, you've moved mountains in our lives, Father God. So uh, we're just so thankful for that. We've, we're thankful for the provision. We're thankful for the sustainment. We're thankful for the joy that you've provided in these times. And Lord, uh, just to continue that and to, to be able to uh, work uh, in this place and, and in this neighborhood, Lord God, uh, we're just so thankful for uh, the support um, that, um, that is given, Father God. Um, and it's all, it's all for your ministry, Lord God. It's all for, uh, in remembrance, Father God, of, 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 the, um, of your provisions, Father God. So here we are, we're, we're, we're giving back into the kingdom, Lord. And we just ask, Lord God, that you would just bless it. Uh, we just thank you, Father God, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And now I'd like to introduce the pastor of New Life Community Church Norwich, Pastor Tom Fitzmorris. George, George, I love you because you don't say merch. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, guys. I'm happy to be here. Good morning. Um, Thank you to everybody this morning. You guys run. I wasn't able to be here in the morning, and man, everything runs so smoothly. And, and you know why that is? It's because uh, I, I was at our Norwich location, and you could tell when you come into someone's house when they have ownership of their own house. Things are taken care of. Things are in order. You can see that there's care and concern. That was over there, and, and it's here too. And I just want to say it's not because of, of any other reason but God has impressed upon this team, of this family, I wouldn't even call it a team, a family, that this is our home. This is the place where we come and we want to take ownership and pride in it. And not a bad pride, it's a good pride. So I just want to say thank you to everybody. So I could give a hand clap to everyone. Okay, let's, uh, let's open up our Bibles quickly because we are going to be uh, reading about the triumphal entry. Um, oh, my Bible's all twisted up. Uh, Okay, it would be in Luke chapter 19. Let's move to Luke chapter 19, and we're going to start at verse 28, and we need to pray before we do this. Father God, um, Lord God, please protect us from going to the left or to the right, Lord God. Protect us from the speaker, uh, Lord God. I pray that you would remove the speaker so that you could speak clearly and loudly. I pray, Lord God, that you would reveal yourself. You are truth itself. You are the glory of God seen by man's eyes. And I know that that truth, that glory is what changes us from the inside out. And I'm asking you, Lord God, with, with earnestness and humility, Lord God, we need you here. We need you to shine so that we can be transformed for your glory. Please, Lord God, we pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Okay, let's pray together. Let's uh, read together if you have your Bibles. Starting at verse 28, it says, Jesus, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he, approached, as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples ahead, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here to me. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord has need of it. Um, stop there for just a second. I want you to understand that Jesus is not a victim. He's demonstrating something to us. Jesus is in full command of what's happening. 
It appears to me at some point Jesus had made plans. I do not believe that this was a supernatural seeing, that he knew it was there, and somehow he used his power, which he could have done. I believe he had determined this. This was a determination. So I want you to understand that when Jesus went to the cross, it was decision. There's a difference. And it's, 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 a, and it's a difference that we, we need to understand so that we can lean on it. So let's keep moving forward. Those who were sent ahead of him went and found it just as he had told them. When they untied the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying this colt? They replied, because the Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks over the colt, and put Jesus upon it. He went along. The people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near to the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God in a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Stop again. Once again, they're worshiping God, but why they're worshiping God is a little bit murky. It's a little bit murky. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed in heaven, peace in heaven and glory upon high, glory uh, in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said, Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. He turned to them and said, I tell you, if they kept quiet, the stones would cry out themselves. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. The word here is not just a tear like you, you have when you watch a sad movie. You know how like when, when we go to a sad movie and we're sitting next to our wife and we don't want to look like big babies, we have little tears and we just kind of like... <laughs> this is not the word that's used. The word that's used is bitter weeping. Have you ever bitterly wept? Usually it's over loss where you're like... <sighs> the word literally means it broke him to the floor. That's the weeping. Let's get... Oh. So I want you to envision it. He says this, if you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The day will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. That happened in 70 AD. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. This is an unpleasant truth, folks. There's a consequence for rejecting Christ. And not only you'll pay it, your kids will. I, I'm just telling you. They will not leave one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This is God's word. Um, when I came to faith, I thought this week, it wasn't because... I made a good choice or someone taught me how to be a Christian. As I look back, I see that God allowed me to prove to myself how desperately in need of salvation I was, truly was. You see, the fact was it wasn't someone who taught me and enlightened me. God, in his infinite power and glory and his eminence, he proved my need for salvation by my own hands. I was my own teacher. When I met God that day, uh, and it wasn't just a one-day event. It was clearly a three-month period as I look back on it. Um, the God that I met offered me acceptance and kindness without anything in exchange. I had heard that message thousands of times before, but the truth of it is just too good to be true. There's something where you hear it, you could be joyful about it, but it's so overwhelmingly good and, 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 and so costless, you're like, come on, it can't be true. There's no such thing as a free lunch. How many times have you been invited? No cost, and you come and they're trying to sell you something, right? This is one of those things. And now I look back, and the reason that he offered me this kindness and acceptance without anything in exchange it was because I was fundamentally incapable of producing anything I could have ever promised God because I knew, and more than that, he knew, my character was broken. That's the difference between decisional Christianity and conversion. 
That's what Jesus came to do. He came to shed light. He came to be a truth. When I knew I wanted to be a pastor of a congregation, I probably knew it 10 years after I had gotten saved. And I knew this. As I learned more about God, I never wanted to convince people to make a decision. I never wanted to indoctrinate them into acting like Christians or talking like Christians or looking like a Christian. Do you know why? Because I had been to thousands of churches that encouraged me to do that, and I never could find the strength in myself to do it without failure. So it discouraged me. And you're going to find discouragement in your walk because you're going to find ends to your own strength. But the truth of the matter is, conversion does something quite different in my life. It allows me to press beyond my failures because I've learned that my salvation really and truly does not depend upon my actions. If you understand that truth, conversely, it then produces what God wants in your life. It's a strange, upside-down kingdom. I was so confident, and I still am of this, that if I could show you God, the same God that showed himself to me, he would not only tell you how to act, he would empower you to act the way that he wanted you to in every situation. And I'm just going to tell you, and you know this to be true, if you're following him, there's no end to what he wants from you. He wants into every room in your house. He wants to be the final authority of everything you watch, everything you say, and he wants to influence every thought you have. If you think you can do that in your own strength, good luck. Because I'm just telling you, it ain't happening you will find you are not strong enough to save yourself. But grace somehow enables us to persevere. And it grows our trust. And it grows our desire for these good things. I want to read to you a quickly a, a quick verse out of a, a song called The Transfiguration. It says, Now I know I have seen the glory, Lord. Your glory, Lord, cannot be unseen. That's another uncomfortable truth. When God reveals his glory, there's only two options for those who have had their eyes opened up. Either I accept it and bow before it, or I see it and seek to kill it. Because when you see the glory of God, one thing comes over loudly and clearly. I'm the king, says God. I don't share my throne. Your life, not your life, it's my life, I've given it to you. And one day, you'll stand before me and give an account of how you lived it. That makes people uncomfortable. I know it does to me. But then it says this, Holy is the Lord revealed before my eyes, and my burning hearts can scarcely take it in. That's what grace does. As I behold your beauty with unworthy eyes, the only song my soul can find to sing is hallelujah. That's why we can scream at the top of our lungs, crying out in praise to God. Because he has conquered us with kindness and love. The fear of the Lord is not this kind of fear. The fear of the Lord is, I don't want to miss out. That's fear of the Lord. Jesus was given the mission of coming to a people that had a vested interest in rejecting him and misunderstanding his message and his life. I thought to myself, John knew this better than any of the other disciples. When I read him, he seems to have a depth of insight that really is, is, is overwhelming. He says this in his first chapter of his gospel in, cha in verse 5. I want to read this. He says, in Jesus was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Now listen to this. He said, the light shined in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. I never understood what that meant for a long, long time. You know, when, when you read scripture, as your friend, I'm just telling you, when you read scripture, I want you to open that Bible and I want you to place yourself there. That's what I do. I try to place myself in that crowd. I try to think to myself, I'm sitting next to the writer and I'm asking questions. You know why? I want to be overwhelmed. You and I 
we're made to be overwhelmed. You don't have this idea that, that usually young women have this idea that there's a soulmate. So they wind up looking for soulmates in a bunch of soulless mates. The truth of the matter is there is a soulmate for the elect. It's Christ. And until you find him, you're restlessly groping for things. That's what we're looking for. You want to be overwhelmed. You come here to be overwhelmed. You should have. You should have come here to be overwhelmed. You should have come here to feel the glory, the magnificence of God. Because that's where the transformation occurs. See, sanctification, that process of getting us to where he wants us to go, doesn't happen because we focus on our sin. No, it's because we focus on his greatness. Quite opposite. We take our eyes off of us and we focus on him. And his magnificence then melts me and reshapes me. That's the counterculture of Christianity. It's the counterculture of Christianity. But going back to this understanding of they have not overcome it, I didn't understand what it meant until I looked at the Greek word. And it's not easy to find it because you've got to go through the etymology. It doesn't really, really give a great definition of the word. The word is, and you don't care, but it's called katalambeno, which means to apprehend and appropriate. Now, there's two parts of that. Jesus is light. For us to really get him, we have to grab hold of him. Somehow, we have to get our hands on him. And then, not only that, we have to then apply him perfectly or allow him to be applied correctly in our life. Because if those two things don't happen, Jesus can become our teacher. Jesus can become a wise man. Jesus can become an example. Jesus can become all these different things, and he'll never be your king. He'll never be your savior. One of the worst, I'm just saying, one of the most dangerous places to be is not only outside of God's word, but under God's word. These were religious people, and they were blind to whom God was. There's warnings all over for us to keep track of our hearts because from it issues forth all the matters of life. I want you to imagine this, that you've lived on a remote island your whole life. You hold no awareness of anything that exists outside of what you have known forever. Your only knowledge is what you've seen, heard, and been told. One day, you're walking on the shore a box washes up before your eyes as if it were a gift from the sea. When you open the box, something inside of the box is, th is there and you lift it up, but you can't understand what it is. You're clueless to its purpose, okay? But something happens. All you know is when you're holding it, it overwhelms you with the feeling that this thing you're holding is more important than you can understand and its value is beyond assessment. See, the reason I don't want to indoctrinate is because we can have the tendency to lower Christ down to our level by methodologies. I got no problem with methodologies, but I'm telling you, what Christ wants from you and me, Chris, is to die. How do I teach someone to do that? That doesn't come by human strength. It doesn't. You can't teach someone to kill themselves. There has to be a power greater than my own. You also understand as you hold this thing near to you, it makes you very uneasy to be around it. Somehow you feel that when you're near it, if you really gave it the attention that it seemed to demand, your life would be drastically changed because of it. Everything you've determined as valuable and self-validating will be jeopardized. If you appropriate or allow this thing to do what its purpose is meant to do, your whole life will be turned upside down. Tom, where's your evidence for this? Matthew 16, 24. If anyone desireth after me, he must deny himself and pick up his cross and follow me. For if you want to save your life, I assure you, you'll lose it. But if you give your life for me and for the gospel's sake, you will find what life is. For what does it matter if you gain the whole world and you forfeit your soul? How much is your soul worth? See, these are questions that we don't like to think about. You know why? Because the answers aren't easy. They, 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 they make us kind of do one of these numbers a little bit. Uh, I don't know, that's just a little bit too deep, and the consequences are just a little bit too much. In John chapter 3, verse 19, 
John is now encouraging his saints to press forward by looking at everything ahead of them through the lens of what everything happened behind them. He says this, this is the verdict. It's as if they're saying this, they're like, John, following Jesus is tough. John, it's hard to follow Jesus. He's like, I know, I know, I know it's hard to follow Jesus. John, I've lost things. You know, John, you told me that he was coming back. It's now 20, it's 35 years, John. How long am I going to wait, John? You know what he says? This is the verdict. All I can tell you, this is the evidence that has been presented to me, and I want you to weigh it properly. The light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light. You're not that people. See, when we're in the presence of the glory of God, that's how we kill the glory of God. You know that, right? We just allow it to become dark. We just pretend like we don't see it. What John is saying, in essence, is this to you and me, that we will never know fully where we are, what's going on in our life, or where things are going until you understand the origin of where all things started. Jesus comes to us and says, I am the origin of where it all starts. You want to find purpose? It's in me. You want to find fulfillment? It's in me. You want to know truth? It's in me. I am truth. Until you find me, you will wander about as though you were lost in a desert. I'm the source of it all. When he said to them, he said, my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. They're like, wait a minute, that's crazy talk. You know what he's saying in a colloquialism? Is when you're with me, I'm the only thing on the menu. It's not Jesus and. That makes me uncomfortable. That has weight. It's got gravitas. The book, The Purpose Driven Life, the author proposes this idea. That it is impossible for us to know truth if you start with yourself. But one thing that history has proven to us, that men are obsessed with the idea that truth can only be obtained when one looks within. You really want to find truth? Look within. Turn to any Disney movie you want, and that same message will permeate the entire film. You know why? Because it's been man's pursuit since the beginning. I will not have this God rule over me. I will become truth unto myself. And the truth is, it's too heavy, and I bend under the weight of it. I cannot carry the glory of God because I am not God. But when I succumb, when I surrender, when I kneel and bow before it, somehow I find strength that is not of my own. I find direction and courage I've never had before. I find confidence that escaped me my whole life. The answer to the kingdom is not over a mountain, it's under the fence. It's not high, it's low. That's the truth of Jesus. That's the truth of Jesus. Jesus' mission is to shed light, and his light is intended to expose and reveal. Those are two words I hate. You know why? Because if I expose too much, you might not like what you're looking at. If I expose too many of my thoughts, maybe you don't want to come back next week. So you know what I do? Like everyone else does, I'll present myself. Hide these things so you can see these things. They're both true in my life, but this one's way more palatable. It makes me look a little bit more handsome. But light doesn't really care about those things. What I see in the telling of Jesus' three-and-a-half-year mission is that people have a common tendency to resist truth. They're either completely insulted and revulsed by the unflattering exposure, and they willfully resist the truth by pretending they can't understand what they're seeing, or they give in to it. In Christ, with us, the ones who give in to the truth find they have to give in to the truth daily. And what they find is that as they look back on their life after 10 years of giving in to the truth, they see a life that is more valuable and more worth 
while than they could have ever imagined. That's what Christ offers us. Never telling us it was going to be easy or simple. He didn't say there would be no cost or no suffering. He said, no, 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 all those things are guaranteed. I'm assuring this will be part of it. But I'm also assuring this. What you lose following me, I'll give you a hundredfold in return. Truth has weight. It's got, con it's got consequence. Let's keep moving forward. Our King Jesus has generally, gener generously accepted the task of being a light bearer in a world that prefers dimness. For some reason, when I thought about this all week long, it brought me back to the first miracle at the wedding of Cana. Remember that? Remember the first miracle at Cana? It was most likely his cousin's wedding. It was in a small town called Cana in a rural county called Galilee. Not a big city. Not a place that you went to go visit. That was where the Hicks lived, Right? And then uh, midway through the most likely three-day event, remember Mary approaches Jesus with a problem. What was, the G what was the problem? You guys remember? The wine was gone. Why did she go to Jesus? Do you ever think about that? Because she knew that he was the only one at that place who could fix that problem. There was no place to go to get gallons of wine. She knew that he could produce wine out of nothing. But that's all she knew. Unfortunately, she didn't understand. She knew that the wine was gone. This was kind of a big deal. Family had come from far distances, friends, business partners, religious figures are there, even possibly low-ranking politicians are at this event. Israel's an honor-based society, and everything that is done there is to protect family honor and appear respectable. That's bad. When I care more about what you say about me than what God knows about me. It creates a purposeful blindness in us. And that's what we see. Mary thinks the greatest problem of the weekend is the embarrassment. What are people going to think? They're going to call my cousin a cheapskate. He didn't have enough wine. So she goes to the one person she knows can solve the problem, her son. But what she can't see that Jesus does see is that the wine being gone is only a metaphor for the spiritual state of the entire people. The people have allowed the joy of knowing the Lord to shrink to critical levels. You know that can happen? And I'm going to tell you how, it's, how the slide happens. See, we have to preach the warnings. You know why? Not everybody who's sitting here is going to be here at the end. I've seen far too many people drop off. And you know what? Every time it happens, it breaks my heart. Bad. Keeps me awake. My wife's like, just let it go. I can't let it go. I can't let it go. How do they do this? Their, 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 their faith, their trust, their leaning on and adherence has been depleted to the last drop. That's the real embarrassment. You know how this happens? By years of religion without relationship. How do we have relationship with the Lord? How do you have relationship with your wife or your husband? How do you have it with your best friend? Do you think it's different? It's not different. You talk to them. You spend time with them. You want to spend time with them. Like I've said it before, when someone says, oh man, I didn't call you for six months, but I've been busy, but I still love you. And I'm like, okay, cool. But let's be honest, you, you really don't. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not upset about it. I'm just saying, come on, man, let's, let's operate in the truth. If I don't want to spend time with the Lord, I'm going to find reasons not to. That's a fact. That's how relationship is fostered. That's how it's uh, matured and nurtured. Spending time. Making the most out of those times. And you know what they did? They let those times waste. They have slowly learned to trust in their jobs and their finances more than they strive to trust in the Lord with their lives, their relationships, and their treasures. They believe in the one true God. That's without a doubt. But they've also begun to believe they can't trust him fully. They are a flock that has now forgotten what the voice of their shepherd sounds like so that when they are in danger, they don't recognize the one that they should run to and they wind up running away from him. They become a nation that has chosen to worship their religion at the expense of excluding God from it.
See, you know, one of the things that I'm faced with all the time is, man, I would love my own building. But you know what? I've seen this happen. Strange thing. Pastors want buildings, and then they get buildings, and then they put big weights upon people's shoulders. And then we get this building, and we do it, and somehow the weight of having that building causes us to start to push away and distrust and protect and we hedge our investment in the Lord. You know what I want more than a building? I want you to sing at the top of your lungs. You know why? Because you can say with certainty, I know how I am saved. I know of, the God's, of this God's love for me. Do I deserve it? No. Could you accuse me any day? But I know why I'm here. And I will sing his praise all the more louder, regardless of the accusations. That's what I want more than anything else. I want a religion that is based on a genuine relationship. Where when someone says to you, God doesn't exist, you say, no, no, no. I talked to him this morning. He's fine. That's what I want. Buildings come and go. This brings us to that triumphal entry. Sadly... The only people that can see Jesus for who he is is a group of three older women. They're the lowest of the low, absolutely. One of them was possessed by seven demons. So the rest of the crowd thought she was a crazy person. But she knew who Jesus was. Oh, wait, there was also a tax collector that everybody said was a traitor. He knew who Jesus was. <laughs> and I'm sorry, there was a the last guy. He was a blind guy. Even a blind guy knew who Jesus was. Bartimaeus. But the rest of the 1.5 million people, they could scream, Hosanna, Hosanna, glory in the highest. But the truth of the matter is they wanted a Jesus of their own making. By the week's end, they would forget his name. That's sad. The leaders we find are insulted and threatened by Jesus, just like us today. When you hear the truth, when the light comes into your life and you're exposed to it, we, he will make it known. It's your authority or my authority. Follow your authority and death and destruction is assured. Follow mine and I'll give you life and blessing. You know, truth doesn't care about my feelings. It just doesn't. Emotions really don't have any play in it all. That's what truth does. That's what light does. But grace does something crazy. It allows me not to cover up and be ashamed or to run away, but it, it encourages me to open wide and say this, I don't have any answers. Can you save me? And magically, strangely, incredibly, that's the answer. That's the answer. Save me. Just like that blind guy, son of David. Have mercy on me. That's what he said in the crowd of 15,000. He heard his voice. Why his voice? They're screaming all around him. Why could he hear that? Because he heard the voice of true faith. Have mercy on me. That's a person who understands their estate apart from Christ. The Sanhedrin they know that they're competing with someone who has the ability to give life and all they do is represent a religion that is lifeless. You know, one of the things that occurs to me is that I can be an excellent speaker, which I'm not. And I could probably, if I were skilled and charismatic, grow a church to 500. And I could have 500 dead people here. You know what we should be doing here when you get here early? We should be cluttered and clustered in groups praying for the Holy Spirit to descend upon us like a, like a torrent so that there's more baptisms. There's a never-ending stream of no, no, no decisions for Christ but conversions to Christ because conversion is a supernatural power that enables us to do what we in ourselves cannot. Decisions have their ends. See, what I want, what you want, I can say it without a question, is for the power of God to descend upon us. Because the glory of God cannot be unseen. I am changed and changing still. That's the glory of grace. 
The king has finally arrived to take his throne as he walks down the ramps. Now listen to this. From Bethpage to Jerusalem, the city of peace, he breaks down and begins to weep bitterly. Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, I have wanted to gather you under my wings like a hen. I remember I read in the Atlantic a long time ago when they had these tremendous uh, forest fires in California and they had gone through this burned out area and when the scientists were there they found a gaggle of five tiny chicks walking around in this area where there's miles of scorched earth. The heat, they believe, in that area was 1,500 degrees and it moved like, I think at like 80, 90 miles an hour. How could these chicks be alive? And they brought these other scientists in, and you know what they found out? That these little chicks, they were with their mother, and you know what the mother did? Kicked out a hole and put her chicks in that hole and put mud over it and took water and saliva and packed it over it, and when that fire came, sat over the top of the hole and was consumed so that those babies would live. That's what your king came to do. If that's not an impetus to trust, then maybe you're not converted. If that's not a reason to say, count me in, then maybe you're not converted. Don't stop coming, because who knows when that happens. But when you know that truth, when that glory is revealed to you, you can either run, hide, but you cannot ignore it. And then you got to give in. The leaders wanted power and they saw Jesus as a threat. The citizens wanted freedom and they saw Rome as an obstacle. The apostles wanted a national victory and they saw Jesus as confusing teachers as the thing they needed to influence him away from. You know Why? Because they wanted salvation without death. You and me cannot have salvation without death. We have to die. And here's the truth. I have to die daily. That's his words, not mine. Do you know when I have to die? In the trenches of my conversations with my wife. I have to understand what it means to be a leader in my home. A leader is not a tyrant. A leader says, what do you need and how can I foster that? I can't handle it when men say, the Bible says this and I've heard it. A woman's supposed to be for the husband. And you know what I say? A man is a leader that gives himself like Christ for his wife. That's not hyperbole, man. That's truth. That's what the spirit produces. But I can't do that if I'm walking through life with my eyes on a mirror. Grace allows me to place the mirror down and start to look around. Truth allows me to see things with a clarity that I've never known before, ever. Jesus wants, and he wanted then and he wants now, to rule the hearts and minds of his people. What he wasn't telling was that the determined blind that power, what he was telling the determined blind was this, that power will never satisfy you. Material wealth has no power to fulfill you or give you joy or peace, no matter what it promises. And freedom is only freedom if it is surrendered to that which is eternal. And complete victory can only be achieved when the true enemy is defeated. Our true enemy is us. We are Christ's competition. And every day, I have to name my enemy. You, Tom Fitzmorris, want to lead me down the wrong way. I hear what you want me to tell her. I hear what you want me to tell them. I hear what you want me to do. But no, you've led me down the wrong road. You're not for my good. He's for my good, and he's telling me to go in that direction. Have you ever heard that conversation within your own head, or am I the only crazy person here? You know you have. Because that's what truth does. That's what truth does. Day in and day out. The true enemy wasn't Rome or taxes. It is rebellion that is rooted deep in my heart. 
And the true problem of humanity is that they need to be saved from themselves. Even after our salvation, Paul clearly states it in the seventh chapter of Rome. Why do I do these things that I don't want to do? I find myself doing them over and over and over and over. How am I going to be saved? I find this war at work within me. Who's going to save this wretch? And then he looks up to heaven and he says, praise be to God through Jesus Christ. And the next words out of his mouth is this. Therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You and I need to see the glory of God in all of its fullness. And when we think we've seen it, we need to see it again. And we need to see it again after that. And we need to keep looking at it and keep seeing all of its magnificence and all of the facets of his beauty until he burns away, he burns away all that dross. I want to read one final verse. I want you to understand that this is what our king came to accomplish. It says in this, for he who knew no sin became sin so that we could be the righteousness of Christ in him. It's a, Either you stand on your own and you're the authority of your life or he is and you are saved and become the righteousness in him. That's what it is. That's what salvation is. And that's what changes the world. Does that make sense? All right, what we're going to do is we're going to ask our sister to come up. Her, her new baptism name is going to be Sunshine because she's such a smiler. And we're going to hear her testimony and I want you to come up with her. And when she goes into the water, I want you guys all to stand up because we're going to celebrate this. And you know what we're going to do after we're done? We're going to pray that there's more of these happening. If there's someone in the seats that need to be baptized, don't sit down anymore. Come forward and say, I need to be baptized. Stop looking for reasons not to cooperate. Grace demands it. Grace will prove itself to be life-saving. Come on up. I'll hold you. You want to hold it? Um, my name is Margarita. I am 46 years old, and I am the mother of 19-year-old beautiful triplets, two boys and a girl. I grew up in the Catholic Church as a little girl. I loved going to church every Sunday and every other day of the week. Um, but when I grew up, I didn't really attend church much. Um, I want to thank God for this beautiful day and this moment. I want to thank Arlene for her help. Um, I started going to New Life Church at Portage Park a few years back with my son Jesus when he got baptized. Um, he was invited there by DeAndre. Uh, then they closed the location, stopped going to church completely. Then I started coming here um, about more than a year ago when I felt like my life was falling apart. I've always believed in God, but never really had a personal relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ until a little bit over a year ago. For 18 years of my life, I thought I had done a great job raising my kids and taking care of my family. Little did I know I had missed the most important piece. I had missed placing the foundation of my home in the rock in Jesus Christ. Um, in God's perfect will and timing, things started to get ready for the hardest, most difficult times of my life. For the past 18 years, my life is basically revolved around my children until they graduated from high school. I felt so empty-handed after many years of being nonstop busy with my kids. Now I had all the time in the world to do everything I've ever wanted to do, but I had no desire to do anything at all. I went through a series of situations that broke me, hurt me, changed my life forever. Depression, anxiety, a lot of fear, my heart broken, my life shattered. At one point, I, even the thought of ending my life crossed my mind. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the broken heart and save those who are crushed in spirit. In a moment of desperation and fear, I lost every little bit of strength. I felt that I had lost control of everything. I fell on my knees and asked him, why, how did this happen, Lord? How is this possible? At the same time, I started to recall everything that I had done wrong in my life, all my sins and all the unforgiveness I had in my heart. And I asked the Lord to please forgive me and to please help me with everything. 
that I, and I told him, God, I give up. I give up. I surrender. I give you my life. Please take it from here. Do whatever you want to do with me, Lord. I needed him so desperately. Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. On one of the darkest days of my life, I was in so much pain and just felt so hopeless. I was on my knees praying and asking God, please help me to calm my anxiety for the future. To calm my heart, please speak to me as to what I need to do. I was just praying and praying to God to please speak to me. Before I finished that thought in my head, Psalm 46.10 came to my mind. Stay still and know that I'm God. And somehow I just felt this peace in my heart knowing that everything was going to be okay. 1 Peter 5.10, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and start steadfast. I really, really thought and was convinced that it was impossible to turn things around. I just did not see any way out, but our God is an amazing God, a God of miracles, and a God of extraordinary wonders. I got of making the impossible possible. God started to put everything back together in my life, and I started to notice all these little things he was doing for me, for my kids, for my family, for my home. And I was just so amazed and at all, at all his love, his mercy, <laughs> and his greatness. I do not deserve him, but I love him. Although sometimes God's process are hard and painful, I am grateful for the pain that brought me to salvation. I am so humbled that the Lord our God would turn his eyes to me and my family and that he would let me see his face. John 10:10, 10, 10, because the enemy only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The enemy came, filled my head with bad thoughts, with hurt, lies, and filled my heart with pain and fear. But God used it all for his glory to bring me to salvation. I cannot brag about the, my love for God because I fail him daily. But I can brag about his love for me because he never fails. He knows my weakness, my brokenness, and still loves me. For now, I know where my strength ends, his grace begins. But he said to me, uh, Corinthians 12, 9, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. And lastly, I just want to read this uh, Psalm 40, 1 to 3. I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steady me. As I walk along, he has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in our Lord Jesus. Amen. Wow. 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 That's, that's a testimony. That's a testimony. Jesus. She's going to baptize, you're going to help. Remember, that you're going to pray, you're going to do the dance.
about you. You could clap for Ed. Do you hear how many people God used in that link? He used him to bring him who brought her. And then you used Arlene. God used Arlene to mentor her into there. We die unto raise to life. Unless you die, you're stay dead. Strangely enough, this is the death that brings life. Every day we have to choose this. Let's receive our benediction. Give me a second. What then shall we say in response to all these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I can't get enough of saying this. He who did not spare his own son, but he gave him up for all of us. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things we need? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who is it then who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died. More than that, who was raised to life and is seated at the right hand of God, is interceding for us. Who shall separate us then from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, for it's written, some say that for your sake we face death all day long, we are considered a sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced neither life, or death, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, the future, nor any power in all creation, nor heights, or depths, or anything else will be able to separate us from the love of God. That is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's a promise, man. That's a promise. No one's excluded from that promise. Every day, that's a, you know what that means? It's a benediction. It means this is a badge I should wear and a promise like a credit card I should keep in my pocket. Let's pray. Father God, I am amazed, amazed, amazed what you could do with the efforts of a few people. Lord God, you can take a church of 100 and reach 10,000. Lord God, there's not a hardened heart you can't tear down. And you know what our job is to do? Our job is to be patient and to trust and to keep our eyes fixed upon you. That's it. Keeping our ears attentive and following when you want. You don't want skill. You don't want uh, uh, fancy looks. You don't want neat, neat programs. What you want is obedient men and women who have done the work of trusting you because grace has produced it. You deserve the glory. You deserve the honor. Lord God, we pray these things with a grateful heart in Jesus' name. Next week, Easter, invite someone. I, okay, thank you very much.